Hello, everyone. Is this working? <laughs> we can hear you well. You can hear me anyway, so uh, anyways, I'll still use it. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it is a pleasure to host Dr. Paul Fioroni um, for this very special lecture on the context of the exhibition of Peter Halley, Convicts, Paintings from the 1980s. Um, this lecture will be followed by a Q&A session led by Michelle Cotton, um, head of artistic program and content at Mudan, and also curator of the present Peter Halley's show uh, in place. So please allow me to introduce our guest. Um, Paul Pironi is a curator and art historian based in Glasgow. Um, he recently completed a PhD on Peter Halley's and recently had it, no? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so it was on. Um, <laughs> he recently completed a PhD on Peter Halley's 19th, uh, 1980s work at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, previously, he was a senior curator at the Gallery of Modern Art, Glasgow, co-curator of the 2015 Turner Prize in Glasgow, and exhibitions curator at Space, Space Studios in London. Um, over the last 15 years, Pironi has curated solo exhibitions, projects by artists such as Alexandra Dumanovic, Mali Mull, uh, Dean Blunt, as well as historical projects exploring the work of Raymond Pettibon, Jack Smith, Katie Acker, Katie Acker Bob Cobbing, Paul McCarthy, among others. Um, Pironi has taught in the uh, History Art Department of Edinburgh University and has been a visiting lecturer at the Royal College of Arts, Glasgow School of Arts, Goldsmith, and ZHDK. This writing has appeared in Freeze, his writing has appeared in Freeze, Flesh Art and Art Review, amongst other publications. He also contributed with an essay for the catalog of this exhibition, uh, Peter Halley, Conduit's Paintings from the 1980s, which is the name of the show, as well as the catalog, um, which is also available at our, our shop. <laughs> Just wanted to mention this little part. So enjoy the lecture. Welcome, Paul. Thank the stage you. is yours. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone, how are we doing? Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, Michelle and her team here, they've been really amazing and really supportive. Uh, I'm just so grateful this exhibition has taken place. Um, and it's just wonderful to see all these paintings, so thank you so much. Um, and thank you also to Peter for making all this beautiful art. It's really wonderful to see it. Okay, so in this talk, which will last about 45 minutes, I will make the case that Halley's paintings of the 80s can be viewed as devices or vehicles of orientation that can help us understand the acute historical tensions shaping social reality in New York City during the 1980s, uh, decades marked by disorientating economic, social and cultural change. Uh, so let's begin by jumping straight in. Uh, this is a painting you'll recognise from the exhibition, Daglo Prison, from 1982. Uh, so what can we say about this work? Well, first, despite being made in 1982, Daglo Prison's uh, geometric blocks, electrified colour and industrial materials and innovative adaptations of support establish a rich and layered engagement with the minimising and clarifying procedures that took place in American art during the 1950s and 1960s. At this time, following on from earlier hard-edged developments in the work of Ellsworth Kelly and Joseph Albers, artists such as Frank Stella and Kenneth Noland moved beyond the loose, gestural and expressive brush roots of abject expressionism and towards a cooler, more impersonal approach <coughs> excuse me, to facture that resulted in works with clearly delineated zones of solid, flat coloration uh, with a particular sharp or hard finish. Now, it's this tradition or approach which ultimately culminated in the specific objects of minimalism that has been quoted by Halley in this painting. And you can see just some images here making comparisons with hard-edged works by Frank Stella from the 1960s. You can see the artistic vocabulary is kind of similar. Same here, this is a, a slightly earlier work by Joseph Albers. Um, I think it's important to note that Halley is quite explicit about this comparison or this use of past art. Uh, as he explains in The Crisis of Geometry, my paintings are executed with a variety of techniques lifted from hard edge and colour field styles. 
So we can say that Halley's work uh, simulates pastiches or reworks a form of minimalist abstraction from 20 years earlier, and that's quite an intentional and obvious element of his work. Uh, now, Halley came in for quite a lot of criticism for this aspect of his work in the 1980s. Most notably, he found himself in the crosshairs of Hal Foster, then a young critic and the editor working in art in America, in a 1986 article, Foster argued that the kind of nostalgic abstraction being practiced by Halley was no more than a ready-made reduction of serious abstraction, a campy recycling of outre abstraction that evinced a post-historical attitude whereby art, stripped of its material context and discursive entanglements, appears as a synchronous display of so many styles, devices, signs to collect, pastiche or otherwise manipulate with no one deemed more necessary or pertinent than the next. Um, I think it's interesting to sort of frame Foster's analysis in terms of another theoretical framework, and it's that of um, preeminent Marxist theorist Frederick Jameson's analysis of postmodernist culture. Uh, there's Freddie Jameson. Um, uh, in his 1984 article, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, Jameson used economist Ernst Mandel's term late capitalism as a historical framework to identify and diagnose a set of postmodernist artistic tendencies that had become prominent in the 1980s. For Jameson, by the 1980s, market forces had infiltrated culture to such a degree that a sense of historical amnesia, a profound disorientation of present artists to historical contexts had come to pass. Observing the, quote, random cannibalization of all the styles of the past, end quote, at, the, at work in postmodernist art, Jameson concluded that, with the collapse of notions of progress and telos central to modernist art, postmodernist artists were left stumbling about in a state of historical blindness and disorientation, which resulted in works with a tendency towards what he variably labeled historicism, nostalgia, or uh, pastiche. And this was a trope uh, at work in other artist, artistic projects from this period. This is a uh, Ross Blechner painting from the 82, 83. And we can see immediately there's a correlation there with uh, Bridget Riley's stripe paintings, her rock art paintings from the 1960s. Philip Taffy as well, this uh, work from 85. And we can see it's a very direct and obvious quotation of a Barnett Newman work. I think there's an aspect of this historicism or pastiche going on with neo-expressionism's return in the early 1980s uh, to European traditions of expressive figuration from the 1910s and 1920s, movements such as Pittura Metaphysica in Italy or Neurosaklichkeit in Germany. Uh, viewed with a slightly wider lens, it's also what seems to be going on with the rise of what Jameson calls nostalgia film uh, during the 70s and 80s, uh, films such as George Lucas's American Graffiti, and Francis Ford Coppola's uh, Rumblefish from 83, both of which set out to recapture, in Jameson's words, the mesmerizing lost reality of the Eisenhower era. My own interpretation is that we remain in something of a nostalgic postmodernist moment, what other theories, theorists, from Jacques Derrida to Mark Fisher, have described as a hauntological moment. We are haunted by images of the past. Retromania abounds in late capitalism. And this is apparent in everything from the music of Dua Lupa um, to the quite unwelcome return of Indy Slees uh, to Harry Styles' fashion as put on him by va various major Italian fashion houses who seem permanently sort of caught in a, a sort of 1970s moment of nostalgia. Uh, thinking through all of this, I think it's really important to recognize that Jameson, like Foster, sees pastiche or saw pastiche as a negative symptom of the increasing reach of capital into culture. Uh, Foster also criticized Halley's citation of French theorists in his written work and interviews of the mid-1980s, but I won't get into the so-called simulationist controversy here. Uh, it's a controversy about the uses and abuses of French theory because it's been covered extensively in the literature on Halley. I want to instead focus on something else, namely the representational aspect of Halley's work. Because a work like Days Go Prison uh, isn't just a pastiche or simulation of past art, it's also a picture of something, namely a kind of prison structure or building. And I dug out some lovely clip art pieces to see how he's tapping a sort of em emblematic image of a, of a prison. Uh, the thesis I want to put forward here 
is that this pictorial or representational aspect of the work can help orientate us in the historical situation unfolding in New York City during the 1980s. To demonstrate this thesis, I'm going to trace the development of Halley's core iconographic motifs, his prisons, conduits, and cells between 1980 and 1982. Then I'll focus on one of Halley's core essays before returning to these uh, paintings for final comments. Um, but before getting stuck into the work, I think it's uh, important to sort of map out what's going on in New York in, in 1980. At this time, after the slow going of the 1970s, the cultural scene was picking up in New York. He had the birth of punk music, no wave and new wave music in downtown New York. There was also the emergence of hip hop and graffiti culture in the Bronx. Uh, in terms of contemporary art, uh, there came the, um, sorry, uh, then there was the rise of uh, so-called photomechanical art of the pictures generation, artists such as Richard Prince, Sherry Levine and Cindy Sherman. We have also the rise of graffiti art, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring and Kenny Scharf amongst others. And as already mentioned, there's the rise of neo-expressionism, um, which began in Europe but had American manifestations in the work of Julian Schnabel and David Sally. Uh, around 1981, the East Village also began to explode as a gallery location. Um, and it's from this scene that Halley a few years later would emerge um, alongside other artists associated with neo-geo or new geometric conceptualism, artists such as Jeff Koons and Ashley Bickerton. This is like a really geeky uh, graph that's in someone's PhD uh, listing when these various galleries open. This only also touches the surface. Uh, many more galleries opened up during this time. Uh, it's just a few more images of this scene. This is uh, the people who ran civilian warfare outside their space. And then we have the two galleries associated with Neo Geo, Nature Mort and International with Monument. And you'll recognize International Monu with Monument from the show. And that's where Halley had his first solo show in 1985. Um, as Peter Shadel, the late Peter Shadel, the critic, um, stated in 1981, uh, more is happening in American art right now than ever before. There is more of everything and everybody. So it was a really sort of exciting moment, a moment of sort of artistic explosion in New York. Okay, um, I want to now sort of trace the development of Halley's early painting, paying, and I'd ask you to pay particular attention to the way urban and social forms, buildings, infrastructural aspects of the modern city, etc., begin to find their way into his artistic iconography. So there's Halley outside his East 7th Street studio. Uh, this was taken in 85, but he actually moved there in 1980. Just prior to moving to New York, Halley was working on paintings that he would later describe as neo-Picassoid. I guess this is a reference to Picasso's sort of uh, analytic cubit, cubist portraits of the 1920s. As he later explained, I went through this intense Picasso phase between 1978 and 1980. There was a sense of a frontal horizontal plane in which geometric things were piled. And that's how I was thinking when I got to New York. However, once back in New York, human figures begin to disappear from the work. These are replaced by angular, multi-sided, triangle and starlight geometries described by Halley as geometricized figures, like some sort of sci-fi synthetic cubism. If we look at another painting, Jacob wrestling the angel, here a multicolored tessellated polygonal figure tilts to the right of the picture's center as if falling away from the depicted scene. And this is just as a large and ominous brown brick wall looms into view behind it. I was worried about the picture quality, but I guess you can see there's a brown wall behind this figure. The appearance of this wall signals a shift in focus in Halley's painting. The new direction the work is taking in the later months of 1980 is towards the depiction of inanimate features of the urban landscape, most prominently architectural forms such as walls. However, before exploring Halley's turn towards walls, I want to briefly exchange a paint, uh, engage a painting that sits slightly out of joint with the other works being made at this time. Uh, this work, The City, features vertically organized uh, rectangular blocks of in black, muted blues, reds, and natural colors. These forms are overlaid in dense clusters, generating an allusion to a skyscraper clad inner city skyline. The importance of the city to Halley's developing painting practice can be identified in a particular kind of perceptual ruse generated by this painting. As one views the city, a kind of visual switching or flipping takes place. 
It is possible to see this image in two ways, either as a purely geometric arrangement of densely imbricated coloured orthogonals, or as an urban landscape. This strategy of creating images with shape-shifting properties, images of ca capable of transforming back and forth between two possible readings, would be something Halley would continue to cultivate during this period of intensive development in the painting. Okay. As mentioned, the paintings Halley would make through the end of 1980 and through to 1981 would focus on reductive deadpan depictions of brick walls. This shift towards austere imposing images of architectural forms was no doubt the result of Halley's growing awareness of the landscape surrounding him in New York City. As he would later explain, in New York I really had the profound experience that the human figure was irrelevant. I stopped trying to pile up some sort of human figure and began painting brick walls, just like home. Uh, and again, as this demonstrates, the city is sort of beginning to sort of penetrate and percolate into Halley's work. Stacked in the traditional one brick over two pattern, known as a stretcher or running bond, brick walls set against horizonless backgrounds become the central focus of Halley's painting for a number of months between late 1980 and early 1981. Walls in paintings such as the red wall, which we've just seen, and behind the wall there is another wall, run horizontally across the picture plane, dominating the space within the frame of the painting, while also suggesting that they might carry on beyond it somehow. Um, but this uh, turn towards walls and bricks is also a, a turn towards minimalist art. And you can see here, I picked a late Sala Whip piece to just compare the brick-like formation. I should have probably put Carl Andre here, but I'm not going to put a slide of Carl Andre up at all. He's a horrible man. Um, <laughs> Um, indeed, these brick wall paintings demonstrate Halley's growing interest in the syntax of modular forms, of the serial order of the brick itself, as it was absorbed into the aesthetic logic of minimalist art. And I've got this nice quote by Robert Morris here that sort of laid this out. This was told to the critic David Sylvester in 1967. There's a kind of order involved in this art that is not an art order. It's an order of made things that is pretty basic to how things have been made for a very long time. The clearest example I suppose you could cite would be the kind of ordering and object quality that you get maybe in bricks and in the way the bricks are, bricks are used. It's a kind of unit in a syntax that has been in the culture since the Stone Age, I suppose, and it's still very basic to industrial type manufacturing. Standardization and repetition and repeatability, the wholeness of a part extent that can be extended. The wall paintings thus mark a turn towards an interest in the syntax of modular, standardised, repeatable orthogonal forms that would be critical for the subsequent development of Halley's painting. But what had been lacking from Halley's work up until this point was a signature iconographic motif. This is, however, precisely what Halley introduced in 1981 with his early prison paintings. Uh, the outside, the um, sort of whiteness of this has sort of blurred the edge of the painting, but you can sort of see what's going on. Uh, this is Little Spanish Prison from 1981. So we can see the prison icon, icon right in the middle. And this is uh, one of the first times that he's used it. Quite curiously, Halley has explained that this barred prison window emblem derived from an uncanny encounter with the facade of the East Village loft in which he set up his home and first studio in 1980. So again, we can see this here. And there's another photo. You have a really good quality version of this photo in your exhibition. And I saw it and I was like, damn, this is from a 1992 catalogue uh, at Des Moines Art Centre, and it's like a copy of a copy of a copy, so I apologise. Um, as Halley explained, I lived in a, in a building on 7th Street. On the ground floor, there used to be a bar or a pub that had a stucco facade and windows with bars over them. I began to do the gel paintings, paintings of prison-type facades. I was in front of my building waiting for a friend one day and realised that I had, in fact, been using this image, which I had never consciously noticed before. It was completely subconscious in origin. So again, you can see how this demonstrates a growing porosity developing between Halley's painting and the immediate urban space surrounding him in New York. Uh, New York seems to be seeping or percolating into the painting, into its images and its materiality. But, yet again, the prison motif is a deeply referential form that seems, to that seems to signal the clarity and emblematics of a range of painting projects from a previous generation of artists. Evident here are allusions to Jasper John's everyday emblems, his target and flag paintings, for example. 
John McLaughlin's crisp and spiritually charged linear markings, and even to the logotype aesthetics of Frank Stella's 1960s paintings. Yet of all these references, perhaps the most obvious is to the plate-like overlaid squares of Joseph Alba's paintings. A foundational figure in the tradition of American geometric abstraction, Albums, Albers is best known for his series Homage to the Square, which he began in 1949 and which continued to his death until 1976. Taking an approach to painting that was relentlessly austere, geometric and anti-gestural, this series set out to explore the tensions between the quiddity of square forms and the capacity for colour to generate impactful illusions of form, space and hue. So you can see the sort of uh, comparison here. Again, the image sort of cuts out the outer edge of the Halley work, so you can't quite see the overlaid square effect, but you get the idea. Um, crucially, while the geometric order of a work like Little Spanish Prison references the reductive geometry of the homage to the square series, the presence of an apparently figurative or symbolic motif right in the middle of the depicted square, the barred prison window, compromises the purity of Albers' work. Uh, as, Ali, as Halley would later explain to Carolyn de Jong, a lot of my early work is the result of questioning minimalism and re reopening minimalist signifiers to the point of, uh, to point to society, to social space, etc. All of a sudden, squares could become prison, prisons. Now, I've discussed pastiche as a common characteristic of postmodernist artworks, but I now want to briefly discuss another core postmodernist strategy that I think is demonstrated here, and that's double coding. For it's this strategy that would appear to be at work in Halley's quotation and subversion of tropes of past minimalist art. Um, now, if pastiche represents something like a crisis of historicity, then this kind of double coding signals something like a crisis of authorship or authorial meaning. Now, this immediately calls to mind Roland Barthes' arguments about the death of the author made in uh, a same titled 1967 essay. The first translated into English in 1967, it was only 10 years later in 1977, with the publication of Barthes' anthology of essays, image, music and text, that this essay came to, rep uh, came to widespread prominence in America. Uh, in the essay, Barthes argues that against relying on the intentions and backgrounds of an author to establish the definitive meaning of a text, the capacity for each individual reader to find their own meanings should be emphasised. Speaking in a 2003 Art Forum Roundtable discussion, art historian David Josselet explicitly aligned what was going on with postmodern painting in the 1980s with Barthes' text, and I quote, in Bath's canonical text, which was widely read in the 1980s, the death of the author was one and the same with the birth of the reader. Perhaps the, quote, new rules which allow new painterly permutations to emerge codify such a displacement from the writerly to the readerly. Tactics of appropriation, which are regarded as closely linked to postmodern painting, certainly fit within this category. Halley himself has cited Bath's influence repeatedly in his interviews. Speaking again to Carolyn de Jong, Halley stated that, quote, I could never accept the hermetic, self-referential claims of minimalism. Donald Judd, for example, said that the forms of his work didn't refer to anything, that they were in fact signifiers without signifieds. In the 1980s, with the influence of Roland Barthes and others, the issue of the signifier all of a sudden became opened up again. Okay, so I want to quickly now turn to the other two motifs introduced to the painting in 1981 and 1982. You'll recognise this painting from the exhibition upstairs. Uh, Prison with Conduit is the first of Halley's paintings to feature a conduit, a rare work in portrait format. This prison is composed of two bolted together canvas panels. As you can see, the second vividly coloured lower canvas is divided by a crisp conduit of black acrylic. Um, you can see other conduit infused paintings here from the same period. If prison suggests an image of containment, fixity and isolation, then conduits contradict this image by symbolising movement and connection in the painting. Neither static or fixed, Halley's conduits are reminiscent of lines of past examples of minimalist abstraction. The monodirectionality of Barnett Newman's zips, for example, or Frank Stella's deductive motile stripes. Like Halley's conduits, Newman's zips and Stella's stripes are not lines of freewheeling action, as opposed to Pollock's tumbling, spinning skeins of tripped and poured paint. Though you could argue that these are structural forms in their own way, but that's another conversation. Rather, Halley's conduits follow specific pathways, 
And in doing so, they uh, symbolize forms of orderly, controlled, systematic or structural movement. You can see some conduit details here. Conduits also suggest themselves as tube or pipe-like containers. Conduit from the Latin conductus, a leading, a pipe. And this is something grounded once again in an imminent sensual encounter between Halley and the built space of New York. As Halley's explained of the moment he first began thinking about conduits, quote, I was working on this idea of the square becoming a prison. I was at home listening to the radio, turning on electric lights, being able to turn on the faucet, flush the toilet, talk on the telephone, turn on the air conditioner. I began to become obsessed with the idea that all these natural things, air, light, noise and speech were being piped in. I began to think about conduits. As this experience suggests, we are encouraged to read conduits as infrastructural elements comparable to commonplace network systems, such as those of utilities or communication systems, or the tunnels of subterranean uh, transportation systems. Conduits can therefore be understood as relational motifs, structures that form connections and relays in the painting between fixed forms such as prisons, and another core motif introduced to the painting in the early months of 1982, cells. Uh, the first, uh, first appearing in White Cell with Conduit, 1982, cells are simple square forms that mark a shift towards a higher level of, of abstraction in the painting. On one, on one level, Halley's cell appeared to repeat notions of imprisonment suggested by the prisons, yet the visual abstraction of this motif is mirrored by an expansion in its possible representations, a cell having a more generic connotation as an abstract signifier, as a cell, uh, abstract signifier of a kind of self-contained or enclosed space. Uh, the appearance of cells in 1982, soon after conduits, marks the moment Halley's cell and conduit motifs were in place alongside his prisons. This latter, this, uh, the cell and conduit uh, unit of motifs allowed Halley to represent a more holistic kind of network vision in his painting. And you can see this here, an, uh, an image of isolated units linked together by way of underground networks of conduits. Uh, this turn towards network imagery in 1982 suggested a whole new register of art historical illusion in the work. On the one hand, uh, this early network style painting, Two Cells with Underground Chamber, clearly resonates with a kind of cybernetic artistic imaginary that is again firmly rooted in the 1960s. Uh, this is a piece by Ulla Wiggen from 1964. Uh, Wiggen's enigmatic and obsessive depictions of commuter circuitry and electronics are Good example of this, for example. Um, on the other hand, somewhat unusually for Halley, given the strong rooting of his references in post-war American art, we might also frame his cell and conduit paintings in terms of an earlier moment of mechanical enchantment in art. The subtle and not so subtle medita uh, mediations of modern industrial infrastructure and engineering found in Fric Francis Bacabia's mechanomorphic portrait drawings that appeared in the Dada journals 291 and 391. Okay, so... Um, oh, going backwards, here we go. Okay, so by 1982, Halley had cultivated a method for creating an unstable symbolic space in the painting. The main aspect of this instability sees the geometry of minimalist artworks collapse into a set of spatial references to landscape, to built form, to network-like technological systems and structures. The elliptical relations generated by this procedure are both representationally suggestive, minimalist forms are transformed into specific things, and historically provocative. The Greenbergian idea of formalist art as pure, transcendent or autonomous is countered by the suggestion that these forms might in fact represent objects in the real world. In this way Halley cultivates a form of painting with the power to switch or flip between pure abstraction and abstracted representation. The result is a defamiliarizing model of abstraction. Uh, I should note that the, the title of this talk is a reference to this capacity to flip between abstraction and figuration, but it's also a track on Talking Heads 1983 album, Speaking in Tongues. You see there's some really nice cover art by Robert Rauschenberg uh, right there. Uh, the question I've yet to answer, however, regards the orientational logic of these paintings the way they locate us amongst the historical tensions of 1980s New York. In order to flesh out this question, I want to now briefly turn to one of Halley's key essays, The Crisis in Geometry, 1984. 
Having sent unsolicited articles to the editor of Arts Magazine in 1980, early 1981, Hay soon became a regular contributor to the magazine. Between 1981 and 1984, Halley published numerous essays with the magazine. These include Beat, Minimalism, New Wave and Robert Swiston, a speculative analysis of conjunctions between literary, musical and artistic cultures in post-war America. Uh, this appeared in the May 1981 issue of the magazine. Another essay was against postmodernism, reconsidering Ortega, which explored Spanish philosopher and essayist Jose Ortega y Gasset's concept of modernism. That was also from 1981. Uh, as mentioned already, he wrote about Ross Blechner's uh, 1981 exhibition at Mary Boone Gallery in an essay called Ross Blechner, Painting at the End of History, which is a really nice dramatic title. Um, another article was Nature and Culture, a sweeping periodization of the immediate post-war years in American art. And finally, The Crisis in Geometry, which is today probably Halley's most widely read essay. And it's an analysis of the relationship between idealized geometry in a range of post-war formalist art projects and a periodized conception of geometricized urban environments. Uh, the Crisis in Geometry is a text closely yoked to the 1970s theoretical work of Michel Foucault and Jean Baudrillard. Regarding the influence of Foucault, sometime in 1981, after he'd already started painting prisons, Halley read Foucault's 1977 book, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison. Drawing influence from Foucault's book, Halley's essay in, uh, meditates on Foucault's analysis of the way in which industrial era urban space is structured around the need to re rationally manage and mo uh, the movement and flow of human bodies circulating through it as part of the everyday grind of industrial life. The innovation of the crisis in geometry comes when Halley associates the geometric abstraction um, of formalist art projects with the castle order of this industrial era urban space as described by Foucault. If Foucault was cited in this essay in order to construct a critical image of the carceral or coercive logic of industrial era urban space, Baudrillard is invoked to describe the fully networked logic of post-industrial social space. How his essay features repeated references to soft geometries or seductive geometries related to technologies such as computers and electronic entertainment. In this way, Halley associates his cell and conduit imagery with a kind of cyberneticized technological vision of post-industrial society expressed in Baudrillard's writings of the late 1970s. Now, in an interview published a year after the crisis in geometry, uh, Halley reiterated the pe uh, this periodized understanding of the form at work in his core motifs. Uh, as he said, I see my work over the last few years as being about working through a change in the way geometry functions socially, from an industrial type geometry to a post-industrial type. I started with a situation of coercive geometry symbolized by the jail. I then moved to a more seductive geometry symbolized in the day glow colors, the systems of conduits, and the sort of video game space I think my painting has now. That corresponds to a movement from Foucault, who mostly talks about coercive, uh, the coercive geometry of industrialism, to Baudrillard, who's more interested in seductive geometry. Now we can say that Halley's prisons on the one hand and his conduits and cells on the other seem to be yoked to specific moments or periods in the recent history of capitalism. This is what this quote suggests, at least. And this is an approach that I think has two important implications for Halley's work. In general, by linking the geometric form of his prison, conduit and cell motif to historically specific social structures, in particular urban architecture, built space and urban network systems, Halley's work takes on a kind of cartographic valence. Halley's model of abstraction demonstrates a will to map or register the features of the world around him. We can say, therefore, that there's an ambition to orientate viewers expressed in the formal logic of Halley's core motifs a desire to somehow visualise or image the city. Halley's reinscription of minimalist geometric form therefore reveals him as a painter of the urban panorama, an artist registering, albeit in a highly abstract way, the different speech features of social space in which he found himself in New York. Uh, secondly, inasmuch as prisons are an attempt to describe the geometry of social space of an in, uh, sorry, describe the geometry of social space ordered by an industrial logic, and conduits and cells describe the logic of social space in a post-industrial moment, we can see that Halley places particular emphasis on the importance of periodization in his painting. 
Uh, this is an emphasis, I would argue, that points to the fact that the early 1980s were a crucial historical inflection point in New York. The moment the city's Fordist industrial legacy was consigned to the past once and for all, after two decades of breakdown and decline. And this was just as an incipient post-Fordist or post-industrial mode of production was coming into full view. We can, there, we can therefore understand how these core motifs as something like attempts to see or map the tensions generated between these two modes of production. Um, now, the question of how to aesthetically map the historical dynamics of capitalism at this chaotic and confusing moment in America's recent history was a question also on Frederick Jameson's mind in the early 80s. Back to Frederick Jameson, as you can see, it's a common theme. There he is, three of him in Warholian mode. Um, uh, for Jameson, this aesthetic project of uh, cognitive, sorry, um, at a conference entitled Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture, held in the autumn of 1983 at the University of Illinois, Jameson presented, presented a paper titled Cognitive Mapping, in which he speculated about the potential of new forms of political aesthetic mapping, new aesthetic tools that might offer orientation during this period of widespread and significant social, economic and political disorientation in America. Disorientation. Um, for Jameson, this aesthetic project of cognitive mapping would serve as an integral part of any socialist political project, offering critical depictions of social spaces and relations at hand in early 1980s America. Um, as media theorist Douglas Kellner suggests in a useful summary of Jameson's position on cognitive mapping, individuals need some sort of image of mapping of their society and the world as a whole. Cognitive mapping involves the task of individuals, artists and theories in providing orientation, a sense of time, history and place through theoretical models of how societies is, is structured, combined with historical analyses of stages of development. Uh, what I want to put forward here is the idea that we consider the model of abstract painting Halley had begun to uh, elaborate in the early months, uh, early years of the 1980s, in particular the way he exploited the strategies of an emerging postmodernist aesthetic such as pastiche and double coding to produce a set of core iconographical motifs that broke with the paradigm of formless abstraction to uh, depict historically specific industrial or post-industrial social structures to share the kind of ambition expressed in the idea of an aesthetic of cognitive mapping Ames, uh, Jameson was attempting to elaborate in 1983. So the value of these paintings, for me at least, is uh, their cartographic value, the way they locate us. Uh, and that leads us to this sort of moment where we can suggest that postmodern abstraction functions as co cognitive mapping. And while there's not the time here to delve deeply into the myriad mapping procedures taking place in Halley's painting, you can read my PhD for that, <laughs> I want to conclude by briefly demonstrating just a few ways in which Halley exploits certain tendencies in 1950s and 1960s minimalist art, for example, its industrial materiality or its mass-produced, uh, mass-production inflected modular serial structural geometry to map this moment of historical tension in New York. And again, just to make clear, it's a moment of tension between a lost or disappearing industrial horizon and an emerging post-industrial one. Uh, regarding the lost industrial city, we have sort of various images from this moment of crisis in the 70s. Um, so by the early 80s, it was clear that industrial capitalism in New York had more or less died. General developments in the global economy led to radical changes in New York's economic base that took effect from the late 1960s onwards. Significant capital flight led to widespread deindustrialization in what was once a proud blue-collar city, as manufacturing workshops, warehouses and storefronts across the five boroughs relocated to more favorable locations, areas lacking New York's high wages, real estate costs and robust unions. This loss of working class industries and jobs took place in lockstep with so-called white flight, the departure of the city's middle class, ta middle class tax base to the suburbs and commuter towns, facilitated by what transpired to be racist policies such as the GI Bill and racist practices such as bank redlining. This turn to de the, in turn, this decentralization of New York's workforce and indeed the flight of industry had been facilitated by the commencement of construction from the late 1950s onwards of the interstate highway system, a vast network of controlled accessed highways that plugged themselves into New York, only accelerating the movement of industry and labor beyond city bounds. 
New York's troubles were further were only further compounded in the 1970s by trouble by solutions devised to resolve a debt problem that had been slowly building in the city since the 1960s. This problem came to a head in 1975 with what is known as the urban fiscal crisis, a crisis that began when bankers refused to continue to purchase uh, debt bonds from the city uh, lawmakers, and which resulted in the city's near bankruptcy. A withering program of austerity and cutbacks drawn by drawn up by an elite of government officials and financiers appointed to resolve the city's debt problem had, by 1980, not only ravaged New York's once famously robust public sector, he had left the city in a state of material breakdown and decay. As theorists Jeff Kinkle and Alberto Descano observe, to speak of the city Halley returned to in 1980, it's to describe a city more or less abandoned by the lifeblood of capital. Uh, I think you can sort of see this in some of Halley's earliest works. These are apartment paintings that are not in uh, this show, but they're in a show of early works in New York that's running concurrently. So we can see one of Perla de Leon's photographs of uh, the South Bronx in 1980 and one of Halley's um, apartment paintings. And we can see a, a similar sort of comparison here. Uh, one way an atmosphere of quite quiet, brooding industrial crisis and social exhaustion is captured in a work like Apartment Painting, this one here, is through Halley's uh, method of forcing uh, representational image, imagery into the airless pictorial space pioneered by American abstract geometric painters of the 1950s and 1960s. Part of the power of this painting lies in its odd insistence that an immediately recognisable object from the real world, an apartment building, can be contained somehow within a pictorial space defined by rigorous planarity. This generates a form of defamiliarized figuration or depiction in Halley's painting. Emaciated, lifeless, we seemingly encounter this building in a state of exhaustion. It's as if history has moved on from this particular structure, yet it remains before us as a kind of modernist rhetoric, denatured and defeated. Um, uh, this is a painting that makes use of a particular kind of fluorescent yellow um, which uh, in, suffuses the sort of architectural prison figure. One way of constructing a social context for this type of light is to consider it as a representation of a specific kind of street light technology. Commonplace in New York until very recently when LED lighting supplanted it, high pressure sodium vapor street, vapor street lighting, known as HPS lighting, bathes the street in an eerie flat orange light. By the late 1970s, HBS bulbs had become the preferred choice for street lighting in New York City, selected for being highly efficient as light sources and therefore cost reductive. As writer Hal Aspen notes, after the energy shocks of the 1970s, high pressure sodium lights gradually took over New York as it consumed very little energy and can last up to 16,000 hours on a single bulb. A work like Prison with Yellow uh, background here therefore seems to glow with the same quality of light and colour as HPS lighting. Uh, the peculiar, transfixing glow of this painting seems to capture an image of a crisis-ravaged urban landscape robbed of, complex, uh, of chromatic complexity by a light form that, in its economic efficiency, signals at one review, uh, run remove the economic tumult and fi of the fiscal crisis years of New York in the 1970s. Um, we can also see in a work like Ideal City, which is in this exhibition, sort of um, after images of uh, industrial era in New York. So the alienating monotony of mass-reduced landscapes, landscapes produced by processes such as urban renewal. And I think this image here is quite symbolic, really. Uh, for me, it's a melancholy image of uh, a factory, you know, an industrial form seemingly fading into the twilight. Um, fading into the night of history in a way. Okay, but shift in register. Um, the 1980s were also the moment of an emerging post-industrial city. Uh, the breakdown and decay of industrial New York reached a climax in the recessions of 1980 and 1981 to 1982. However, by the middle of 1982, as President Reagan settled into his first term in office, alliances between corporate and state interests put in place to resolve the fiscal crisis were well on their way to reconstructing New York as a neoliberal post-Fordist city. And, it was, and this was just as new forms of monetary capital liberated by a wide range of regulations greenlit by the Reagan administration began to flood into the city. If urban decay and social breakdown had an imposing impact on New York's urban subjects, the covert 
if not invisible quality of new forms of privatised capital restructuring the city, alongside a more general impulse towards new technology and network systems, only redoubled this effect. Um, and we can see this turn towards technology and network systems mapped in Halley's work too. Uh, this is his one and only moving image work, computer-generated piece called uh, Exploding Cell, which you'll see upstairs in the exhibition. So you can see it clearly correl correlates with the aesthetic of 8-bit technology emerging at the same time. Uh, we can also look at these abstractions as, as sort of being similar to the sort of com emerging computer systems at the time. And we might also relate them to the way the shadow finance uh, industry was emerging at this time. And I think that's something definitely sort of baked into Halley's use of two separate canvases, an above visible canvas and a below invisible canvas. I just want to clarify a point here about representation, however. Um, to be clear, the idea that the abstract, minimalist aesthetic of Halley's paintings could successfully represent the systems that work in contemporary network capitalism, the complexity of a fully wired up trading floor, for example, its myriad of telephone and computer connections, its screens and its connections to real lives and to mortgage judgments, policies, banks, legal systems, etc., is of course absurd. While this is the kind of complexity we mean when we discuss things like financial networks, it is not something that can be captured in a simplistic painting featuring squares and lines. However, this way of viewing representation in terms of cor correlation as a kind of mirror held up to reality or a photographic image made of it is clearly not the form of representation at work in this painting. Rather, I would argue it's the very simplicity of a painting like this, its very failure to properly represent the fibrillating complexity of new forms of network capitalism that, I would argue, successfully expresses something of the unbridgeable void between individual experience and the vast underworld of advanced capitalism's shadow technological networks. In reducing an image of advanced technological networks down to the most basic relationships between elementary geometric forms, squares and lines, and in pitching his paintings as diagrams, yet withholding captions, keys or indexes, Halley's paintings can therefore be read as reflexively engaging the very problem of representation, particular to new forms of technological capitalism. And we can see a few more allusions here. This is one often made between the uh, silicon chip and one of the paintings that's upstairs. Um, Halley's use of dayglow paint also seems to sort of conjure the aesthetics of screen-based technologies, iPhone uh, aesthetics in particular. Um, and in a 2016 interview, Halley commented on the, this connection directly on his use of Dago colour, which is obviously a reference to 60s abstraction, uh, but it also chimes with these new technologies. As he stated, there were a few artists using fluorescent colour, Warhol, Stella, but at the beginning of the 1980s, at the beginning of what I consider to be the digital era, our world was getting more electronic, more colourful, more intense. And it really seemed to be that fluorescent colour was the way to express that. I wanted my paintings to have the light of technology. It's absolutely true that my work has become more popular with people since the iPhone came along. There's something about the idea of glowing, something that generates lights that seems to appeal to humans. Okay, pretty much at the end here, but I just want to conclude with some suggestions for the historical influence of Halley's work. Um, one possible reference is to YBAR of the 1990s. Um, an argument can be made that Halley's pursuit of the social logic of abstract geometric form established an important example to the YBAs, a generation born roughly a decade after him. Uh, these are uh, Gary Hume's very Halley-inflected door paintings. Um, we can also see uh, some sort of comparison with Rachel Whiteread's work. This is a piece um, called House. And bringing us right up to the contemporary moment, I would argue that there's a trend of socialized minimalism uh, that continues today that was very influenced by Halley. We can see that in something like Cameron Rowland's work or Park MacArthur's work. And finally, this piece by uh, Stuart Middleton from, from last year. Okay, that's it. That's the end of my talk. Thank you, everyone. Oh, it's very tough. Is that too tough? <laughs> I'll flip it when you make your way over.
Hello. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. Maybe I can start by um, before while well, we just uh, find a second microphone for you. Um, just by saying thank you for such a uh, fascinating, well-timed, and oh, well, <laughs> engaging. I didn't actually look, okay, but I, I think well, it was so. Yeah, um, engaging talk, but also one of the most visually stimulating talks I've seen here at Mudam. It, it was, uh, I don't think Peter's ever been in the company of, or Peter's work has ever been in the company of Harry Styles. Thank Dua you Lupa. for making that link. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was really enjoyable. Um, I'm sure there are other questions. I hope there are other questions for the audience, but maybe I'll kick us off. Um, because one of the things that has preoccupied me of course, putting together an exhibition of an artist who's still living and working, very much part of the conversation also for our, our show, were, was um, the relevance of Peter's, showing Peter's 1980s work today. And as someone who spent the last five years looking intensely at this body of work, I wanted to ask you what, you, what your take on that was, um, why you think we should look or maybe, or, yeah, what's what we can find in, or how we can locate this, uh, the relevance of this 1980s painting um, in our own moment. Um, I think it was Dan Cameron who said, uh, I think this is in the Saatchi um, New York Art Now catalogue um, produced for the Saatchi Gallery show in 86. Uh, I think in that catalogue, Dan Cameron says that Halley is one of the few artists who is effectively restating the project of abstraction for his own moment. So just in very basic uh, historical terms, if we consider abstraction to be something that's constantly coming back in a sort of orbital historical movement, then I really feel Halley is the most important abstractionist for that period in history. Um, much as many critics didn't want to recognise that, I think um, he restated abstraction for the 1980s. Um, and, you know, as suggested by the, the images of his influence, while, again, certain critics didn't approve of it in a way, I think a lot of artists did because he, he reopened abstraction. Um, and I think there's some really interesting games you can do with history based on that notion. Um, one fun game to play, and it's something that Roberta Smith from the New York Times has done in her writing, is to align Halley with Kelly and to talk about Kelly as this moment because obviously Kelly's work is very inflected by urban imagery, be it the you know, sh shadows on stairways. Um, and her argument seems to be that, you know, just before the real hardcore formalist turn, um, you have this sort of teetering moment where abstraction is sort of partly about the real world and partly about pure form and then we go straight into the, the literalist moment of minimalism let's say which is very sort of hostile to representation but then if you imagine Halley as someone uh, that we encounter coming out of minimalism and again the city re-enters the real world re-enters so I think in simple terms he offers uh, a model of abstraction that isn't hostile to representation and I think for people wanting to use abstraction, for example, in, as a diagrammatic tool, that's incredibly fertile, perhaps more fertile than, than notions of literal form that you get in, say, minimalist abstraction. Thank you. Mm. Um, I, I want to come back to that uh, abstraction and the flipping, th uh, the notion of flipping between abstraction and figuration that you... Um, you touched on in the talk also. But before I do, um, I want to talk to you about Harry, uh, Halley's European... Not Harry style. <laughs> not, not Harry, no. <laughs> well, maybe later. <laughs> but um, I want to talk to you about Halley's Europeanness uh, or mm. Euro, Euro appeal. Um, because these paintings were produced in New York and you articulate so well, so beautifully, um, that how they, how their origin and their socio, in that socio social technological moment um, is kind of um, seeps into the work but Peter maintains that their critical reception their primary critical reception in that um, era was in Europe and I'm thinking particularly also of uh, the first institutional exhibition in Krefeld in Germany 
that told to the ICA and to St. Etienne mm. in 89, and then the exhibition organized by CAPC in Bordeaux that traveled to Lausanne, to Rene Sophia, Madrid, um, to Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam in 91. Why do you think that the why do you think that these paintings, which are so deeply informed by their immediate mm. environment and conditions um, and condition of living in late twentieth century mm. America, found their critical kind of um, home, as it were, mm. or found the critical or spoke so clearly to European audiences? Yeah, it's a really good question, and I don't I don't have a a clear answer. It's somewhat mysterious. Um, it could be um, to do with you know traditions of abstraction in Europe being different to traditions of abstraction in America. Uh, you know, I think the hostility to certain forms of abstraction in America were very much built upon a generation of October critics who took it upon themselves to, to really oppose Greenbergian formalism. So there's a micropolitic there to do with American art history, which I don't think is as relevant in Europe. You know, um, Yves Alain Bois, for example, came from a tradition of worshipping Greenberg and he arrived in America and everyone's like, no, he's the devil. And he's like, what? Um, so it could be that, 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 that for tastemakers, for those who would set the agenda for Halley's art, um, that art historical tectonics are different in Europe. That's one guess. Um, but... I don't know. I mean, coming to Luxembourg, it feels almost like we're in a Halley um, painting of some sort. So, um, you know, I, I think it's po possibly important to, to pass this notion of Europe a bit more and to say it's really, a, you know, Eurozone Europe that really embraced these works because they were sort of in Britain a little bit, but n not so much. The big shows were really sort of Italy, here, sort of um, Switzerland, Bischofberger buying a lot of the work. So I don't know. I think maybe there's something um, hard-edged about this part of Europe, um, geometric, um, that, that sort of just chimes on, a, on an aesthetic level. But I certainly concur that Europe has been the spiritual home. I never forget watching an episode of MasterChef and seeing a Peter Halley painting hanging in a very posh restaurant in Modena, I think, in Italy. And you're just like, okay, this stuff is really embedded in the in this European world in in a way that it isn't in America. And we, and we spoke a few days ago about, you know, where um, Halley's legacy is in America compared to Europe. And there's some definite differences. It's very curious. But I don't have a fixed answer. I don't, I'm not sure. I'll come to the flipping. Um, <laughs> most people would classify Halley's work as abstract. Mm. Um, here we've in the museum we've been actually surprised by how younger audiences uh kids actually en engage and with and actually love this work and read it as um figurative you know or read it for its figurative elements and you put forth a very compelling reading of the paintings um in their representational terms or in representational terms is the pervasive classification of this work as abstract um an oversimplification, or uh, is it in some ways a misreading of this work? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I think Halley's quite clear that he, he, he described, or historically, I think it's in his 80s interviews, he, just wanted, he said that I don't consider my work abstract, I consider it diagrammatic. Again, so much of this conversation is bound up with the micropolitics of, uh, of, of a post Greenbergian abstraction, right? So in one sense, it's not abstract if we understand abstraction to mean pure abstraction, formalist abstraction. But I think one of the important lessons we take from Halley is this widening of the meaning of the term abstraction. So for me, these are abstract paintings. It's just they're not purely abstract. Um, and I think, you know, it's not an accident that Halley was making kind of cubist work very, very early in his career in the late 70s and early 80s. And if you consider analytic cubism, it's abstract, but it's also representational. And its potency is in the, I guess, the movement, the journey from one to the other. So this idea that uh, an image, a figure, can begin to fragment or tessellate or become cubic, uh, that says so much, I think, 
about social reality at the moment that it's taking place. And again, why I think Halley's a really important artist for now is because um, he offers us a visual language for abstractly representing reality. Um, and in an age where we place a lot of faith in realist images, in documentary images, uh, I think we lose um, like a theoretical or conceptual possibility congealed within abstraction itself. Um, and, you know, Halley's a master at that, at sort of using abstraction. Um, but I guess the answer would be abstraction is not um, like a characteristic, it's a process. And these are definitely images in the process of abstraction. They are abstracting, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank mm. you. Are there any questions from the audience? I'm struggling to see you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so if you... <laughs> my green. <laughs> yeah. Should have been... Come on, Rob, you've got to have a question. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, I was just thinking about, it's more of an observation, really, about Halley being well-received in Europe and less so in New York. Mm. Um, I'm trying to remember what you showed alongside it, but th thinking of his peers, mm. um, America is just very weird. So, um, <laughs> I mean, Basquiat was not accepted at all by institutions. Mm. I mean, he's barely... I don't think there's any of his works in, in Moma's connection now. Right. Um, so I was just thinking about that a bit. But um, Schnabel obviously had huge commercial success. Did he have institutional attention? I, d I don't think so. I mean, there's a big, there's a terrible portrait in the Metropolitan Opera of, um, who's it of again? Placido Domingo, I think. <laughs> it, it's, Fittingly. It, it's hilariously bad. Is that a crockery piece? No. Oh. No, just just um, just really crude, stupid painting. Yeah. Um, presented by the friends of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think what you're pointing to is, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I just went on a uh, Jeff Koons deep dive like a couple of months ago and systematically watched everything online that the Whitney produced for their massive um, Coons retrospective. I think it was probably the last um, show they did at the Brewer building, so 2016 maybe. And Scott Rothkopf um, is continually having to defend this choice to show Jeff Coons' work. And I think what this points to, and it was just, just interesting to see it because I'd been so locked into Halley, I hadn't really thought about it with a wider lens but um, you know I think again speaking of historical tectonics the 80s is a really ticklish subject for a lot of people and I think a lot of people are m more comfortable placing um, the art of the 80s in some sort of parenthesis because a more convenient narrative is you know a long process of waning minimalism and then bang, the Berlin Wall falls down and we get a sort of a globalist art movement and then we also get the return of the real, the return of the body and this sort of odd, awkward, theoretically infused um, moment which only lasted, you know, a few years um, can just be junked and put to a side. I think also like the, 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 the fact that this was art celebrated by um, blue chip people at a time when a lot of money was flooding into the art world, a lot of money, an unheard of amount of money. It's, 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 it's hard for us now, we're so used to this finance-infused art world, but the shift from the 70s to the 80s in New York was mind-blowing for people. I mean, they, they had something similar in the 60s with um, pop art didn't sell in America. It, it mm. did, but it didn't sell to sophisticated people in New York. It's sold to industrialists in the Midwest. It, and mm. it's it sold in Chicago rather than New York. And the same, the first people to buy pop art, I'm told, were German industrialists. Um, you know, desperate for some, I don't know, 
to invest in... Huh? Yeah, people like Ludwig. Um, and um, what's his name? Uh, Zverna's dad. What's his name? David Zverna's dad. <laughs> Rodolf. R Rudolf Zverna. Um, yeah, sold a lot of pop art. Mm. And so people like Warhol sold first in Europe, not, not so much in the States. Mm. But I think I in the end, it's, it, it's m I've not read the book, but I, I wonder if it's a kind of um, that thing David Batch that identified chromophobia. You know, this, this, the idea that if it's brightly coloured, it can't be serious. Um. Yeah. So if it's brightly coloured and it sells and people love it, it can't possibly. Yeah. Um, yeah, which, 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 which speaks to a trope of equating um, sort of seriousness with authenticity and playfulness with being a bit suspicious somehow. Um, also makes me think: Did minimalism sell that much? I've kind of been reading about how you know Donald Judd's financial issues, Richard Serra bankrupting himself. So there's some things that maybe art history is just much more comfortable with austere, sort of um, financially, sort of not obviously financially attractive work, something like that. But it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. It's a big question about the fate of the work. That's the question. What? What? Go on. Go on. Ask, 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 ask the question. <laughs> no, I really don't. <laughs> I'm going to repeat what you said. No, I'm. I'm truly awful at this. I'm. I'm I mean. Ah, okay. I mean, the question of how Foster's original critique is really sort of complicated and layered. Um, I, I think it's hard to separate it from the moment, and I think Halley was maybe a victim of circumstance. But w what I can say is that if you look at Foster's critique or you look at similar critiques that made their way into Ivan and Boire's work, um, you know, there just simply isn't that much attention being paid to the painting. Um, most of it is about the essays. It's a reaction to certain theoretic formulas that are located in the essays, and that's all good and fair. But um, you know, I certainly feel that this sort of critique of simulationism—it's basically, you know, worrying about how images become duplicitous and problematic through their accelerated circulation. But for me, at least, the best thing we can do to confront that situation is to pay attention to things to really look at images. And I don't think anyone could say, if you read an essay like Signs Taken as Wonders or, or the essay um, uh, that he, 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 um, he wrote 10 years later for uh, The Return of the Real, um, th there just simply isn't the sort of engagement with the work itself and you wonder how much work he was looking at. Um, so again, I, I think Really looking at Halley's work is, is an important task, an important project, and that's maybe not what was happening at the time. But you should send him a catalogue and see what he says. He would probably get... I'd be, in, I'd be interested. I mean, it would be... A, a, a Halley Foster round, like discussion, Q&A, would be so good. And I don't know. Yeah, it would be really... I'd be super interested to hear them discuss things, um, you know, with the power of hindsight and... You know, like Foster's very antagonistic to Neo Geo, for example, that moment, um, and sees it as the worst emblem of commercial art. But you actually look at it historically, and it was artists running their own spaces, selling directly to, co to, le to collectors. Um, in terms of our art fair model of today and various other things, it was really quite pure. So. Yeah. Like, that's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to write about it. Sorry. They they were supposed to write about it in their magazines. Yeah. And then the institutions were supposed to get excited about it. Yeah. And then the industrialists were supposed to buy it. The idea that artists cut out those 
um, the critics essentially it yeah. would have infuriated them. Yeah, yeah, and especially Halley with his writing, and you also think of the Collins and Malazzo stuff. I mean, can you imagine how what they would? Have, I mean, he was young when he was doing that. Who the hell is this precocious upstart? Yeah, writing theory. Who the hell yeah. is he? He didn't go to a university. He didn't yeah. hang out in Nova Scotia. Yeah, you know. Yeah. That's oh okay yeah yeah, but was that on? But that wasn't. But the October people didn't go to Yale, did they? Uh, I don't know. I'm, it, but it's interesting because Foster is making a claim around postmodernist art at this time, writing anthologies around postmodernist artistic form, and it's you know an irony that I can't get my head o around is the fact that in 1986 he writes the crux of minimalism which ends with certain arguments and conversations about the possi po possible social readings of minimalism that, that grate against its uh, purported hostility to representation. So he's doing what Halley's doing at the same time. But it, that makes me think that you're correct, that what we're actually dealing with is social relations and not cogent art historical arguments. We're dealing with uh, cultural differences rather than the work itself, which is more like kind of not even considered, but that's kind of in inherent through all um, Marxist philosophy. This endless contradictions and and mm. inter you know d internal um, just struggling yeah. with with their own hypocrisy. Yeah, um, I say that as a fan of Marxist philosophy. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I say that as a Marxist. <laughs> Yeah, well, in some sense. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's a good place to end it then, the Marxist struggle, Marxist eternal struggle. <laughs> um, it only remains for me to thank you once again, Paul, for um, bringing your extensive research and thinking on Halley to Luxembourg and enriching this exhibition and catalogue, which I have, I can hold up now for the benefit of um which antonio mentioned earlier um tonight